Yeah, Bad Boys for Life from Pixar. No, I don't think so. Wait a minute. No, our least family-friendly film of the bunch. But welcome to those of you at MoChurch.tv. So in college, in my dorm, I was an RA, so I didn't have to have a roommate. I got the whole dorm to myself with two beds. I could just sprawl out if I wanted to. And I always had movies kind of rolling when I wasn't studying, sometimes when I was studying. If it wasn't the original Star Wars trilogy, it was three other movies, Tombstone, White Men Can't Jump, and the original Bad Boys film. And so my friends would always be kind of dropping into my room and we'd be quoting lines together and watching a chunk of the movie and then we'd go on to do something else. So I was pumped when I heard that a third Bad Boys movie was coming out this year. I was stoked. I was watching IMDb and other things about who was signing on to the movie and who wasn't and all that. But Bad Boys for Life uh, was the highest grossing film of 2020 so far. I mean, there's only been four But, you know, it's the highest grossing film of 2020. It's also the highest grossing film of this franchise and the biggest January release of all time. And so people are going to see it. I actually met three of my dude college friends uh, that used to drop into my room and watch it with me. We met in Columbus as a central point. Now, this is my best friend, Chris Simpson. Um, This is Lyle, which is actually his cousin. And uh, this is John, one of my buddies, also from college. And that's your boy right there. That's your boy, all right? Thank you. All right, one person cared. Um, and so, man, those are some of my buddies just to get together and watch it together for the first time. We all vowed we wouldn't see it till we got together to see it together. And so Marcus Burnett and Mike Lowry are detectives in the Miami PD. And the real draw of the Bad Boys franchise, any of these movies, for me, is really that friendship between Marcus and Mike Like, I absolutely love the friendship and the chemistry they have, not only as actors, but in the fictional realm of friends. Like, the real draw is that friendship. You know, it's funny because the the film is full of funny one-liners, and there's car chases and gunfights and explosions, and that's, that's all great. I love that stuff, too. But these guys are partners. They're like brothers to one another, but they also, like brothers, argue all the time. And they're always fighting. 90% of the humor is them bickering with each other about stuff. And so it's always about Mike's body count or Mike's love life or about Mike being a rich kid who dresses like a drug dealer in Marcus's terms. And then on the other end, it's Marcus damaging Mike's expensive sports cars or Marcus trying to be a cop and a pacifist at the same time. I'm going to penetrate him with, with my heart, you know, that kind of thing. And so when Mike dates Marcus's sister in the second film, that is just this blow up of them bickering and fighting about that. But they're partners. They're like brothers though. And on the other side of that bickering, it, it comes from this closeness that they have that they're always watching each other's six. They're always watching each other's back. They're, they're like brothers. They're a team. Sometimes they might play good cop, bad cop, and, and they work witnesses together or informants. And, and Mike, who's single, you know, will go to Marcus's house, who's a family man, and eat dinner and spend holidays with them. It's like he's part of the family. It's like he's Marcus's brother. And that's the real draw of this franchise for me. Even in between the one-liners and the action scenes, It's that friendship, the connection between these two brothers who are bad boys for life. It's like that whole concept of having a friend that's like a brother. You know, it's like having that partner who's got my back, you know, who I know no one's ever going to say anything negative around me or around that person and them not speak up for me and say, wait, 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 wait a minute. No, that's not Dan. Like, if if you said that, you must have misinterpreted what he was meaning, because I know Dan. That's not Dan. And someone who would speak up for me. And so that friendship chemistry that they have, that's the draw for me. That's what I want. That's ultimately what you want. It's why growing up, you watched Cheers or Friends or Big Bang Theory or, ironically, Martin, you know? It's why you watch those shows, because you want something like that, someone who's bad boys for life. They get it. And so turn to 1 Samuel 18. I'm going to be using the NIV version. You can download the free Bible app on your phone. So in ancient Israel, there was a young man whose name was David. It's also important that you know he was the youngest son of Jesse. That comes up in the text. And David slays a a giant named Goliath one day in the Valley of Elon. It's during the standoff between the army of Israel and their enemies, the Philistines. And Goliath was a Philistine. And so while there's the stalemate... And the army of Israel is being led by the first human king of Israel, King Saul. There's a stalemate, but, but David slays Goliath. 
And afterward, there's a guy named Abner, who's the commander of the, the army of Israel, who brings young David to King Saul. And by the way, David's still holding Goliath's bloody severed head in the scene, which is pretty dope. So he brings Goliath's head to Saul. Abner brings David to Saul. And in that scene, there's this guy named Jonathan. And Jonathan is the eldest son of King Saul. So he's, he's the crown prince, okay? And he's also, he has been fighting the Philistines. So he was in the... Uh, uh, the army of Israel, but previously him and his armor bearer once broke through enemy lines and together him and his armor bearer killed 20 Philistines together. So this dude, Jonathan, is hashtag stud, all right? So Jonathan and David kind of meet in the scene and they're drawn to each other and a friendship begins between the two of these dudes. It says in 1 Samuel 18, this is what happens next. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his home. So now Saul's going to have him live in his own household. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Now, after David killed Goliath in this scene here, Jonathan perceives that God had anointed David. He had chosen David to be the next king of Israel. Think of how that important that is here because Jonathan perceives that God has chosen David as the next king and not himself. He's the crown prince. Like that's, that's what he gets being the eldest son of King Saul. And so Jonathan perceives that of David. He recognizes it and he accepts it. And it's funny because, you know, this doesn't translate well to a secular society today because we, we glorify sex, we sexualize everything. But here, the idea that he takes off his robe and gives it to him is essentially the same as giving his crown to David to say, I get it. God has chosen you to be the next king of Israel. So then for the next couple of years, we really don't know exactly how long, David lives in Saul's house, like in his royal court. So then it also, we realize through the story that, that Saul, while Jonathan perceived that David was going to be the next king and he loved it, King Saul also perceived that David would be the next king and he hated it. He was envious of David and he was jealous of David. He didn't like the songs that people sang about David who had killed Goliath and the way that they celebrated David. And he became murderous, King Saul did. And it's almost like he became this lame duck king, if that were even possible. So during the time when David lived in Saul's house, Jonathan did everything he can as the son of Saul to protect David from his murderous, envious father, King Saul. And so sometimes Jonathan successfully protected David, and other times... Frankly, he failed even though he tried. It says in the next chapter, 1 Samuel 19, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason. Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. Then in the next chapter, chapter 20, um, King Saul's attitude, his envy toward David takes uh, a turn for the worse. And it says, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, his son. And he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. I'm going to let you translate that. Okay? If you're thinking it's something offensive, you are correct. Okay? <laughs> and he says, don't you know that I have, don't, uh, I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse, David, to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you. He goes on and he says this. As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. And then it finishes by saying, why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Notice how he's always thinking about his friend because the, Saul, the spear was whipped at him. And he's like... I think he wants to kill David. <laughs> so then Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. He was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of 
David. And so Saul is just out of control. He's filled with this paranoid rage, and he can't stand that David is going to be the next king, and his son won't be. He hates that he's not as popular as David, the next king. And then finally, the last episode here in chapter 23 says, David learned that Saul had come out to take his life again. This happens over and over. We've skipped many situations where Saul has tried to kill him. And Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. It says the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. And that's an important scene because that's the last time that they ever see each other before Jonathan follows his father into an ill-advised military campaign. And King Saul, Jonathan, and Jonathan's brothers are all killed in that fight. So that, you know, skipping some scenes of Saul going after David and trying to kill him and taking armies after David, that's kind of the narrative arc of this Bad Boys for Life team of Jonathan and David, the rightly famous friendship of Jonathan and David. Eugene Peterson, who's a scholar, but he also wrote this famous paraphrase of the Bible called The Message, um, he said something really interesting about this friendship. He says that Jonathan and David, they make a covenant in chapter 18, at like the beginning of their friendship. Then they renew that covenant of friendship in chapter 23, which is the last time they see each other. So Eugene Peterson says that Jonathan's friendship with David brackets the evil in David's life. Now that's kind of cool because not only is that true literally, like is the beginning and even the end of their friendship, but what he actually means beyond the literal meaning of that is he's trying to say, that Jonathan's friendship contained the evil. Like this was the worst season of David's life. This, he, the king's always trying to kill him. There's all this evil from Saul in his life and Jonathan's trying to protect him and Jonathan really brackets that evil. He contains that evil. In fact, you would say, if you look at the story, that the only reason David survived, the only way he made it through this terrible season of evil that we don't know how long it lasted, even a few years maybe, in fact, the only reason that David actually ever got to be king of Israel was because of his friendship with David. Jonathan's friendship was essential to David. And that's important for you and me because you can't get through adversity without friends. And you'll never get through life without adversity. Like somebody needs there to be there to bracket the evil. In fact, you can make a syllogism about this and say, so putting these two together, you'll never get through life without friends. Period. You can't do it. You can't get through life and survive the darkness and the evil and the things that are going to happen to you if you don't have friends. You need some bad boys that will be with you for life. That's what you need. Now, what about, Dan, what about siblings? But what, about, what about my spouse? What about those? Well, sure, if they're also friends, Right? Okay, siblings, you're just going to make it through them because you've got common blood. You're not going to make it through evil seasons of your life because you've got some people who have some of the same DNA as you, you know, or whatever. You come from the same mother or whatever it is. You're not going to make it through tough seasons with this person unless they're your friend that you're married to. Sexual chemistry isn't going to get you through the worst times of your life. That's not going to be the case. That person also has to be a friend. And so some lessons from, from bad boys is one that we're already alluding to. The first one is that a friend sticks. Like a friend is someone who's like, I'm with you for life. Now you may move away from each other and that friendship may change how it looks, but you always know that they've got your back. They're there for you. They're there for you in a crunch. They would pray for you for asking to pray for you, whatever. But bad boys stick. I'm talking about faithfulness. I'm talking about longevity. I'm talking about constancy. Like Jonathan and David, they made a pact of friendship which I think is super cool, that they say, we're going to stick together. Like, we're going to make a friendship. In fact, in ancient times, that kind of pact was called a covenant. It was a promise. It was an agreement. And, And more specifically, it was a pact before God. Like, it was a spiritual pact to say, hey, we make this pact together before God. I'm your brother for life. In fact, Jonathan called it sworn friendship in the name of the Lord sworn friendship in the name of the Lord. Now, you might look and be like, okay, come on. This is like clearly we're dipping into ancient times because people don't make packs like that anymore, do they? Oh, they don't? We ride together, we die together. 
bad boys for life. Like that's their slogan in the film, Marcus and Mike. It's introduced in the second film. Mike says it to Marcus during a tough time. He says, we ride together, we die together, bad boys for life. And that becomes the title of the third film because there's something about that that people want. Like, man, that's what I want. I want a friend who's sticky. Like, they're going to stay there and they're going to stick for life. In fact, when the second movie came out and that mantra was introduced uh, in 2003, me and my best friend that was in that uh, photo, Chris Simpson, we started saying that to each other all the time, texting to each other all the time. Something would be going on, something random would happen. Like, man, we ride together, we die together, bad boys for life. You know, send it back and forth to each other. That's become our mantra that we've stolen, and it's just become this thing that we say, we're going to stick together. Kids do this all the time. It's like this is natural to us, but eventually we're like, oh, wait, 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 we don't do that. We don't make packs together. We don't sit, we're going to say we're going to stick together for life. But kids do this all the time. Like, we're going to make up a club. It's going to have this name. We have a secret handshake. We're going to be blood brothers, right? Okay, this is exactly what it is. It's a covenant. It's a pact to say we ride together, we die together, bad boys for life. Other people call it, that's my ride or die. You know, this is my bestie. That's my BFF, my best friend. What? Forever. Yeah, it's just like this is a person we're always going to be there for each other. So a formal pact or a covenant, let me be clear, it's not necessary. I'm not saying you have to start calling, hey, hey we, got, we got to make a pact, you know. But it, it isn't something, but it is just shows you that friendship is covenantal. Like friendship, it's a type of commitment to say, okay, I'm going to be there for you. Listen to what Proverbs 18, 24 says. I love this verse. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. You need friends to get through life. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Isn't that awesome? Like, yeah, this this totally gets. There are fake friends. In fact, this really is kind of describing the difference between users and friends, right? Like a user is conditional. A a, a friend is unconditional. A user always has that little calculator out, like cost-benefit analysis of this friendship. Like, man, am am I getting more out of this than I'm putting into it? That's a user. Like, am I getting more out of this? Because I just got to make sure I know that this friendship is worth it to me. That's a user. And sometimes it's very, very, you know, like explicit. Like they're, they're networking or they think you've got connections or you can open up doors for them. It's a very explicit type of user, even if they never say it overtly. You know, I'm trying to get your vote kind of thing. You're know, like, man. But then there's other ways they are just more implicit. And that's like they, they look at you and they see quietly, man, this person's smart. This person's cool. They're successful. They're good looking. And I just, I, I feel better about myself when I'm around this person. But ultimately, when things get tough, times get hard, the, the, the cost-benefit analysis calculator comes out, doesn't it? And some of you have lost people that you were like, man, I thought they were my friend, but when I hit this season of my life, it exposed the fact they were actually a user. Like, because as soon as I wasn't able to give the output for them, and all I needed was input because I was going through a broken relationship or in addiction or a struggle with depression or I lost someone in my family, as soon as they realize, like, man, I'm giving so much right now and I'm just not getting back from them, they disappear, crickets. Like, you're like, man, I got more users around me in my life than friends. And that's the thing. Jonathan was the opposite of a user. Marcus and Mike are the opposites of users. They show up. They stick when time gets hard. Jonathan was constantly sacrificial. In fact, you can argue he was true to his dad, King Saul, consistently, but also somehow true to David consistently as he tried to protect David even when Saul was in the wrong. Marcus sticks with Mike and Jonathan, Jonathan sticks with David. They're bad boys for life. A friend will never let you down. A friend sticks. We ride together, we die together. Bad boys for life. My preacher friend, Tim Jones, who's a comedian, um, he's, he's one of my best friends also. Um, he talked to me about a time when he first got into youth ministry and he'd just been married to his wife, Lisa. They had a home that had an alley behind it and on the other side of the alley was a middle school and he said that was the fight spot for any kids in the middle school. They were going to fight like, after school, punk, what? Well, your mama, your mama, you know, they're going back and forth and they come out and he said they'd form that perfect geometric circle that was un, you know, totally recognizable as that's a fight circle, you know. And so it always happened behind their house in the alley and 
one day, he was coming home, walking home, and he came into one side, uh, the mouth of an alley, and it was just breaking up one of those perfect geometric circles. He was like, by the way, every one of these kids is flunking math, but yet somehow they can form a perfect circle out in the alley. You know, so they all get back out there, whatever. And he said, right when he walked in, he said, he immediately saw that it was like a big kid versus a little kid. And he said immediately, he's like, oh no, I'm going to be on the news tomorrow. Like youth minister wrecks some kid from a middle school, you know, beats up seventh grader. He's like fuming immediately, but it was just starting to disperse. And you could see that big kid won. And he was like the popular, good-looking kid, much bigger than the other kid. Everybody around him, his buddies were all the good-looking kids with like nice clothes. And they're all smiling, high-fiving, patting him on the back, cheering, yelling. And then there's this one little kid who just got his butt whooped. And he's walking the opposite way of my friend down the other side of the alley, heading that direction. And you can tell his hair's all messed up. He's got blood trickling off his face from somewhere. His shirt's like all funky sideways. And he said, the image that stuck out to me, though, was... There was this one other random kid walking alongside of the kid who just got the crap kicked out of him. And he was just walking alongside of him, leaving this crowd, this raucous, you know, cheering. His hands shoved in his pockets insecurely, has no idea what to say. But he's just walking along with his buddy who just looks like life beat him up. And he's like, man, it's hard for me to tell that story because I get teary. I think about that's what friendship is, man. Like when life hands you something, when you get your butt kicked in a season, that there's still somebody like, I'm with you. I'm sticking. I don't know what to say sometimes, but I'm, I'm with you, man. I know I don't have anything to gain. I have nothing. I, I can only lose from walking with you in this situation, but I'm a friend, and I'm going to stick. That is a friend that sticks. That's bad boys for life. Second thing is a, a friend opens up, okay? Now, I know it's going to get awkward, okay? I know you're going to start... Some people are going to start, oh, but my temperament, my temperament, the family I grew up in, you know, all that kind of stuff. But just hear me out, hear me out. A friend opens up. Like, we're talking about transparency, vulnerability, letting someone, letting someone see your soul. This is very, very healthy for you in friendships. To be, it doesn't have to be you're always like, just like crying and weeping and blah, blah, blah. But to let someone in and be vulnerable. In the third film, Bad Boys for Life, it's uh, about Marcus and Mike investigating a string of murders that are somehow tied to Mike Lowry's past. And of course, they're going to let you in on that as the film goes, but, but late in the movie, cool Mike Lowry sits down up against this wall, teary-eyed, and, and he lets his guard down, and, and all teary-eyed, he starts sharing something really stupid and really dangerous that he did before him and Marcus became partners and friends when he was younger. And, and, and I, I love that scene because... It's just like one of these tips of the hand in the Bad Boys film, the third one, that just shows you they're trying to take you to some even deeper places than they've gone in the first two films. And, and I love that in 1 Samuel 20, between Jonathan and David, there's this time out in the wilderness. Jonathan goes out in the wilderness where David's hiding to tell him that King Saul is going to try to kill him again. And Scripture says David bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept, but David wept the most. Now, I love this because there are places in the Bible where we look back on like ancient times and we see stuff like men weeping and kissing each other, like, you know, like those kinds of kisses with each other or whatever, and they're sharing their feelings. And we look at that, you know, like we got Jonathan and David weeping. In Acts chapter 20, by the way, you got like Paul weeping because he's leaving the elders of the church in Ephesus and he knows he's never going to see him again. And you look at people like Jonathan and David weeping and kissing, and this is where people are like, oh, that's some erotic man love right there. That is some erotic man love. And this is a covenant of marriage. It's a gay marriage between David and Jonathan and those kinds of things. But, but it's not, it's, these are just bad boys for life. And we are just not used to seeing guys who like express their feelings with each other and love each other deeply and aren't afraid to say, I am in this with you for life. I, I'm not going anywhere. In fact, remember Jonathan called their pact a sworn friendship before the Lord. And so we're just not used to seeing that kind of stuff. And what's interesting is back in ancient times, when men really were warriors, like it wasn't just a metaphor, they were out on the battlefield 
like swinging swords and they were out in the wilderness killing wild beasts for dinner with little more than their bare hands and flint knives and bows and arrows, stuff like that. It's funny that, that back then, you know, like that's what guys were doing. So back then, back when men really were warriors, they didn't have to keep up a front of being tough. So when things were like hard, they could tell their brother and weep to their brother and hug them and embrace and tell them, why does your father just keep trying to kill me? Like I haven't done anything to him. And they could actually share how they felt. But today, it's like men, we don't know we're warriors. So we're like trying to keep up a front. We're afraid that someone might say, hey, those two dudes love each other. You know, and we have to come to some kind of homophobic conclusion like, oh, no, I can't, I can't be like that because I don't want anybody to think I'm gay and we get all homophobic about it. Like, and, and so it's like guys are like, man, because I, I don't know that I'm a warrior, I, I just got to kind of put up this front. I can't ever share feelings, can't ever be vulnerable, can't ever let anyone in and see my soul. How, how do you do that? Well, I mean, some simple ways to do that. I've, I've tried this. I've got some friends I'm really close with like Tim and then Chris that I've shared. But I've also got other friends that are deep friends of mine, but it's really tough to get beyond the surface of just talking about football. Uh, like some the friends are long time, and I have to ask them simple questions. Sometimes things like, hey, tell me about your highs and lows. What's the best thing going on in your life right now? What's your low right now? Just get talking about something that's real, like it's some real talk. Or me and Shannon triple date with some other couples who are also in ministry, and we ask them, man, on a scale... Of, of one to ten, are you surviving or thriving? And, and, and you know, just one is, I'm, man, I'm surviving. I'm just getting my butt kicked right now in life. You know, we got new kids. We got new babies or ministry or leadership is tough in this way. Work is so hard. Or am I thriving? You don't have to spin manage it. If you're doing well, tell us. We want to know what's good going on in your life. We want to celebrate with you. Yeah, man, things are like a nine right now. We joke whenever we're all like sevens, eights, nines, tens. We're like, when we come back, we're all going to be twos and threes. Like next time we ask this question, it's just the way it goes, you know. And so that's a way to kind of dig in. And I love that when Mike shares teary-eyed that stuff from his past and Bad Boys for Life, when he shares it, I love that it's like a thread through this film franchise that after he shares this deep stuff, there's funny moments and Marcus like talks trash to him a little bit, but then they get up, hugging it out. I love you. I love you, man. I love that they always say, like these are dudes shooting guns and fighting people, wearing muscle shirts in the earlier films. Will Smith ain't wearing them much lately, but you know, wearing muscle shirts and that kind of stuff. But that they say, I love you, man. I love you too. They say it all the time. The first film, they say it. I mean, I love that. In fact, me and my buddy Chris Simpson, every time we get off the phone, and even often when we're laughing our butts off together, it usually ends with, man, I love you, dude. I love you too, dude. I love you like my brother, man. You like my brother. I always tell him, I love loving you with the kind of love that I love you with. That's what I always tell him. And he's like, yeah, man, me too, man. We'll type it out sometimes. I love loving you with the kind of love that I love you with, you know? And it's just, man, we are just, that, we're brothers, we're brothers, and I love that we don't hesitate to tell each other, man, I love you, man. We've been through a lot together. I love you, dude. You're like a brother to me. Tim Jones, the guy that lived behind that alley, he's a different sort. He grew up in a family didn't express feelings very much. And one day, several years ago now, he was like, you say you and Simpson always like end phone calls, well, kind of like you do with your wife or your kids. You say you love each other. Just, I kind of want to say that to some of my best friends. He's like all awkward about it. Like, I want to tell my boys, I love them, man. I want, to, I want to be able to express that. I love you. And that kind of look like, oh, cool. That's cool. Right, so I wanted to let him do it for the first time. We were getting the end of a phone call. And all of a sudden, he got real mumbly at the end of the phone call. He's like, all right, I'll talk to you later. He's like, okay, all right, I'll talk to you later, man. Nothing. We hang up. <laughs> like, all right, he just ain't ready yet. I'm cool. <laughs> totally cool. I, said, I, don't, I don't have to push things or whatever, you know. Take it his pace, but I'm cool with it. <laughs> Next time we talk, he was like, I tell you, last time we were on the phone, I said, I love you, man. And you said, okay, bye. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't hear you. It must have cut out or something because I said it. And you just responded, okay, bye. He goes, four years of therapy, down the drain. <laughs> but man, it's not like you have to do that because I know some, some people struggle telling their own wife, I love you, or their own kids, I love you. Not I challenge you, I poke you on that a little bit. But it's just this idea of you can't spend your whole life expecting to have close friendships with your spouse, you know, with your best friend. Honestly, if you're emotionally constipated all your life, you know what I'm saying? 
Like, you can't go through your whole life being afraid to ever express how you're doing, how you feel, or you will never grow as a person if you're just walking through life. Mm. I know that's not the image you wanted, but that's what you get, okay? Emotionally constipated, you have to be able to open up to people. It's your own pace, but taking steps. Last thing is this. A friend strengthens. Man, a friend strengthens. Like, I'm, I'm talking about spiritual friendship especially. Like spiritual brothers, spiritual sisters. Like, man, I, I don't know, the, again, I don't know the third movie to me is the best in the franchise. I was kind of like, oh, that was fun to see them back together. I don't know it was the best script, but I still liked it. I definitely still liked it. But it does, although it has these funny immature moments, which I tend to love, these immature moments and trash talking through all of it, there's also these, it tries to go to deeper places throughout these films, you know? So it tries to take you to other things. Like it really draws out the point of bad boys for life. And what I mean by that is the themes now are things like becoming grandparents and, and family weddings and retirement and aging and funerals. Like this, this movie is willing to go into deeper places than the previous films have and that's truly us getting to see what the title implies. These guys are not just jokesters and partners in work. It's in life and for life. And in the movie, Marcus ends up at Mike's bedside in a hospital. And, and he's there every day when Mike is going through a tragedy. And Marcus wipes the drool from his face. And, and, and he even colors his goatee for Mike. You know, he's like got the grays coming out of it. And he's like, I want to keep that looking good for you. He colors his goatee for him when he can't do it himself. And there's even a moment where Marcus even goes and prays for Mike. He's like, God, please, please. And you're like, man, this is a totally different kind of scene than we're really used to seeing in the Bad Boys franchise. They've grown up and it feels different. Things are getting real where it's like it's, Life's too real to not express your love, to not pray for, and to, to go to bat for the person that you really love. In fact, I love in Jonathan David's story, we see it says, David learned that Saul had come, to, come out to take his life again. And Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Like, okay, man, let's get real. Like, you're running for your life. I'm coming out here to kind of help you find strength in God, who's called you to be king. You have to trust him. And I imagine he prayed for him. I imagine he found ways to just say, you got to know that I'm behind you for life and that God's here with you. What a great model for spiritual friendship. We find strength in each other. Let me kind of tangent for just a second and kind of say, man, there's so much going on in our season in life right now. And you know, there's, uh, some of you are going through your own stuff with, man, I got little kids, or I got relational problems, we're trying to work through stuff in our marriage, and, you know, stuff's going on at work, or I've furloughed, all this stuff, presidential election, wah, wah, all this stuff that's going on, and, and it makes me just want to be like, man, how many of you are, like, exhausted in this season right now? Just like, oh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm exhausted right now. Well, in, in her book, Dare to Lead, Brene Brown, famous, famous author, mentions an article from the Harvard Business Review, and it's talking about an organization that, that goes to research companies that are reporting high levels of exhaustion. So stay with me through this. This is fascinating. So this team of researchers goes into companies to see why are they so exhausted? Why do they have such high levels of exhaustion in these companies? What's driving that exhaustion? But what they found out was that the employees, although they were actually exhausted, but actually, it wasn't just because of the pace or the tempo of their company. They were actually exhausted because they were lonely. That's, that's fascinating. And so they're exhausted because they're lonely. And that loneliness was manifesting itself in the feeling of being exhausted. Sometimes loneliness manifests itself in this feeling of being exhausted. Sometimes you're like, yeah, I know I do. I got to do that to little kids. But man, really, the true thing is, I'm lonely. Like, that's why I'm so, because it manifests itself in, in a way where you're like, when you're lonely, like, man, I feel lethargic. I don't want to do anything. Like, I, you just think that you're tired. You don't want to get out of bed. And, and, and so now, if I were to ask the question instead of, how many of you are just exhausted? If I were to ask the question of you, truth is, how many of you are just lonely? Like, some of you would be like, man. 
And now fewer, fan, fewer hands would move, right? Because it almost feels shameful to admit that. That feels so raw to say I'm lonely. You feel like somehow that's an indictment upon you as a person or whatever. But just in the end, there's a lot of people lonely and it's simply because they're just not connected or sometimes reaching out. And that breaks my heart because I know it scares me even a little bit because I know there are people and people that I don't even know at Momentum who are, who are isolated. And I don't know that they're isolated or they're, they're struggling with depression or some people who are harming themselves or thinking about killing themselves. And this is all going on. Like It just goes back to without friends, you won't make it through life. You just won't. And so often the answer to busyness and exhaustion are simply connection and inclusion. Like sometimes that's the root of that feeling of exhaustion. That's why sometimes we proactively talk to our volunteers in like October because that seems to be a season where people feel burnt out. And so sometimes we try to proactively talk to them and just say, hey, if you're feeling burnt out when you're serving or leading, sometimes the best answer isn't necessarily, although it seems logical, to take a step back and say, I'm going to take a season where I'm not going to serve, I'm not going to lead, because that kind of exacerbates the issue, especially if what you're really dealing with is, I'm lonely, and I'm going to isolate myself and cut myself off from my Mo group or my teams or whatever. And so I just want to say, if you're lonely, man, you need spiritual friends who can strengthen you. To bring this tangent back around full circle, you need friends that are going to strengthen you. So we are right now in our season where we usually launch our Mo groups, and, and we are doing that right now. It just looks a little different because of coronavirus. Some are all virtual. Some are meeting in person. Some are a combination of the two. But just check the website at the Mo groups page, and we have a few groups that are meeting and rolling, and we're working hard to continue to roll out new groups and pay attention to that because there are new ones that are on the come up, and, and we'll be emerging here at the end of September and October also. But keep checking the website for that current list of Mo groups. Um, as more groups are added. But I, I'm just so in, encouraged by Scripture. I'll wrap up in just a second here, but just to say, like, I, I see how God sometimes raises up people among his people that are exactly what the community needs. And it's so cool and encouraging to see that constantly through Scripture. Uh, you might not recognize all these names, but everyone needs someone like Jonathan, you know, who stands beside you no matter how difficult and evil things get in your life. And there's this guy named Nathan, who, who's actually a prophet in the Bible. You need a Nathan sometimes to tell you when you're sinning, you're out of bounds, you're blowing it, or you're in dangerous territory, but they love you enough to speak up. There's Esther, who courageously speaks up for you when you need an advocate. There's Aaron and her, who holds your arms up in battle when you don't have the strength to hold them up anymore. There's Barnabas, who will tell you when you're a rock star. Like, man, you are good at that, or you did kill it at that, and there's just an encourager, and you need to hear that. There's Priscilla and Aquila, a, a, a married couple who will tell you when your doctrine is just a little bit off, and they'll have you over for dinner and just kind of explain gently, that's not quite orthodox. Let me open up the scriptures for you and teach you a little bit more about doctrine. There's Paul, you know, who will invest in you like a spiritual big brother, spiritual father. Then there's Timothy, one of his disciples, who will tell you when you are worth learning from. I mean, there's all these cool characters. You're like, man, that's amazing. That is what I need. I wouldn't be lonely if I had some of those. But I'll tell you, you can't possibly find all those people to gather around you in your life. You need a community to find people like that. They are sprinkled throughout community. You need a Mo group. You need a church to find those different kind of characters. And the truth is, everybody wants those people for their lives, but people also have to be those people in other lives, right? And so a friend strengthens. John 15, wrap it up with this. Jesus told his disciples this. He said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He says to his disciples, no longer do I call you servants, but I've called you friends. And the cool picture of Jonathan and David is this. David was saved by Jonathan's sacrificial friendship and you can only be saved by Jesus' sacrificial friendship. Like the idea is that Jesus was on a cross and could have, at his beckoning call, had angels show up and destroy Roman soldiers around him and those who were insulting him and mocking him. But he didn't. He stayed on the cross for you. 
He stayed in there, that constancy, that faithfulness, that commitment. He was a true friend. In fact, that alludes back to Proverbs 18. Uh, There's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's ultimately talking about Jesus. You need Jesus, and you also need friends around you, but you need the friend that sticks. And so the question for you is, do you believe that? That Jesus didn't just generally die for mankind. He died for you. He stayed on the cross for you because of how much you mean to him to make a new covenant scripture says not just for everybody that would accept him but for you to become blood brothers with you jesus did that for you a friend that sticks closer than a brother let's pray